In the second ever episode of Locked On College Basketball, Andy and I each made three bold predictions for the 2022-23 college basketball season that were almost certain to go wrong, and most of them did. Today, we take a look back at just how bad things were. Come wallow in the misery with us, folks. You are Locked On College Basketball, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey, what's up? Welcome into the Locked On College Basketball Podcast, the only daily national college hoop show out there. Yes, even during the offseason, Andy and I are here with you five days a week on Locked On College Basketball, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Already said it, but we are your hosts. He's Andy Patton. I'm Isaac Shade. And to you everydayers, we're so glad you're here. If you're not an everydayer, come join us every day, especially This week, we are getting to the deadline where players have to pull out of the NBA draft if they want to come back to college, and you're going to want to know who all of those players are. We'll have that for you this week. Coming up on the show, we've got six bold predictions that we made ahead of last season. And boy, Andy, (laughs) you know, uh, Major League Baseball players, if they, uh, the, the best baseball hitters in the world, get paid millions of dollars and fail 70% of the time. So I think we're in good company here. Uh, we failed more than 70% of the time, but yeah, we're in good decent company. <laughs> Remember folks, bold predictions are supposed to be bold. They should go wrong or mostly wrong. And uh, what's going to be fun about this is we're going to look back what went wrong, what went right, what went sort of right, what mm-hmm. maybe were we just a little bit too early on. And so mm-hmm. that's where these sit. I cannot wait to do this again next year, Andy. This is such yeah. a fun exercise. And so, folks, we're here. You're here. Let's just call out our old cold takes exposed. <laughs> we'll start with one of mine. My bold prediction, one of them, was that Oscar Shibwe would not repeat as the National Player of the Year. But as part of that, I also said that he would average 20 rebounds per game and that Drew Timmy would... 20, Andy, what am I doing? (laughs) And that... uh, But Drew Timmy would be the National Player of the Year. So, obviously... I was right about Shibway not repeating. Zach Eady ran away with that consensus yeah. national player of the year. I was wrong about Oscar Shibway's 20 rebounds per game. He went from his uh, uh, like 15 something the year before down to 13.7. Mm-hmm. And I was wrong about Drew Timmy being the national player of the year. As I already said, mm-hmm. that was Zach Eady. Andy. What do you think? What what what? Where did I go wrong? Where did I go right here? Yeah, the, the Shibwe, his season last year was a little bit interesting. The rebounding numbers uh, went up offensively. He was kind of more aggressive, crashing the offensive glass. A significant drop as a defensive rebounder. He had two less defensive rebounds per game. Uh, positioning kind of played a factor there. Kentucky was just kind of odd. Last year, it's something we talked about a handful of times. I think if you go back in our feed, you'll see episodes of like, is you know, is this the end for Coach Cal? Is Kentucky cooked? And then like a week later, it's like Kentucky's great. Like they're flying <laughs> high. Like they just kind of went through these big ebbs and flows throughout the year last year. I think it's safe to say that the additions they made uh, in the portal didn't really pan out as they had hoped. Uh, Antonio Reeves was was fine. He was solid for them. And, and right now, there's some significant question of whether he's going to be back for this team next year. CJ Frederick never really stepped into that role that uh, that the team had hoped for for him. And, and I think that some of that kind of impacted how they used Shibwe offensively. And then also, I think he just wasn't as he wasn't in the same positions to, to play as many minutes, to be as dominant uh, as an offensive force and less minutes, less rebounds. Like that's kind of the, the ultimate answer here in a lot of ways for Shibwe. I think uh, it was certainly an understandable to, to have him in the national player of the year conversation. And he was in the national player of the year conversation. Same with Drew Timmy, two of the players that you mentioned there, but as much as a lot of people had that enthusiasm around what a fuller season could look like from Zach Eady, I don't think a whole lot of people, and feel free to correct me if I'm wrong, Isaac, but I don't think a lot of people were saying on November 8th when the show came out, like Zach Eady is going to just run away with the National Player of the Year. But by three weeks later, when Gonzaga played Purdue in the, in the um, Phil Knight Invitational, I remember that there was already talk at that point about Zach Eady. So it didn't take long for him to kind of dominate that conversation. But early in the season, Shibwe and Timmy were, for obvious reasons, some of the the primary picks there. And and both of them had really solid years, but, you know, nobody was competing with what Eady was doing uh, for the Boilermakers. No, and and it does make a ton of sense because 
uh, the the Edie of it all because he's coming out of sharing that front court with um, Trevion Williams the year before and basically had it to himself last year and just both took advantage of that opportunity and had clearly grown a ton over the summer. By the way, let me do say something about Oscar Shibwe's rebounding. I did some just crunching of the numbers while you were talking there, Andy. Let's remember, Oscar Shibwe started the year hurt and really had to work his way back into form. Mm -hmm. Kentucky's final six games of the season. Here's his rebounding numbers. You ready? 17, 20, 13, 15, 25, 18. Wow. Over Kentucky's final six games, he averaged 18 rebounds a game. Now, that's still not the 20 that I astronomically shot for, <laughs> but that's like two and a half rebounds above the silly numbers he had the year before. Yeah. So, um, like, if he does come back to Kentucky, and I know there's going to be some competition for minutes, obviously not with Hunter Dickinson, who didn't end up there, but no, right. <laughs> uh, there's possibility there. However, the game right before that stretch – four rebounds so you know I, I don't know but he, he certainly got better as the season went on Andy let's flip things around and look at your first bold prediction yeah so the first prediction I had for last season was Pella Larson from Arizona winning Pac-12 player of the year and I recall <laughs> during that conversation saying that there was probably going to be a better likelihood that his teammate Azulis Tubelis would take home Pac-12 player of the year and neither did to be clear, that went to Jaime Jaquez from UCLA, as I think was the preseason favorite for a lot of reasons, and ended up winning it because he's really, really good <laughs> at basketball. Uh, but Tubelis had a fantastic season as well. Larson, just he had a fine season. He just didn't really take the steps forward that I think many people projected from him. And it was, I mean, we can't really critique Arizona season too much. They ended up with a two seed. They were the clearly the second best team in the Pac-12. At times looked like potentially the first best team in the Pac-12. Like they had a fantastic season. Tommy Lloyd is awesome as much as people criticized him a month ago in a panic after the Princeton loss and not landing Ryan Nembhard. He's, he's a fantastic coach, but Larson... He got a bigger share of the minutes, which is kind of what we expected. He went from playing just under 21 minutes per game in his sophomore year, his first year at Arizona, to about 27 and a half minutes per game last year. So he did get an uptick in minutes, but he didn't see significant changes otherwise. He averaged just about 10 points per game, four and a half boards, three assists. That's really, really productive numbers. Uh, for a guy who played 35 games, he started 18 of them. He basically split the season as a starter and as a reserve. And my kind of inkling here, Isaac, is that we might have been, I might have been a year off. I think so. I'm, I think I'm so. not, I'm not quite ready to say Pell Larson, bam, Pac-12 player of the year next year. I'm not sure I'm <laughs> fully ready to double down on it, but looking at what's being built right now at Arizona, they obviously have Umar Balo coming back. That's huge. They have Keelan Boswell is going to have a big role. Jaden Bradley comes over from Alabama. He's going to play a big role for this team. Like there's some kind of enthusiasm building around what's going to, what this roster is going to look like. They just lad landed uh, Kishad Johnson from San Diego State, the transfer, uh, obviously a player with extensive NCAA tournament experience right. now. And I think that Larson's going to be the guy that kind of slides into that starting three spot. And if he plays 30 minutes per game, you still want to see some uptick. Like last year, his three-point percentage dropped, his two-point percentage dropped a little bit. Like if he can bump those numbers up, which is not easy to do, but play 30 minutes a night, I don't know. I still think he's probably not player of the year caliber. I don't think he's suddenly going to drop 20 a game, which is kind of what you need to do. But right. could he be Pac-12 second team next yes, year? That's exactly what I was about to say. Yeah. Absolutely, he could. Um, is that going to give me a win, uh, like a, a retroactive win? No, not necessarily. But I think that there's some room for Larson to, to have a really solid senior season next year at Arizona and be a, a really big piece to what I think is going to be another really good team for Tommy Lloyd. Man, I can't wait to see if you do make this bold prediction all over again. <laughs> Uh, when we get to November, whenever it is that we mm -hmm. do that, I think that would be hilarious. No, clearly it's going to be Bronny James will be the Pac-12. <laughs> no, hey, maybe. I, I think honestly, right now, your favorite is probably probably Boogie Ellis. Like, I, I, that's I, what I would guess yeah, as well. Not yeah. Bronny, but but Boogie, he could yeah. do it. Balo's an interesting choice as well. Yeah, that man, it's good. Honestly, though, it is a lot more wide open than I think it would have been last year for Pac-12 Player of the Year, and uh, that'll be a fun race to watch. Also, I love that you said first best earlier yes right i thought it sounded weird but i, I rolled with it because <laughs> it means like anyway that's hilarious i love it <laughs> well isaac you had a fun prediction about villanova we say fun 
uh, in quotes there. And I had a prediction about San Diego State guard Darion Trammell, a player that not many had even heard of before the season. We'll tell you what those predictions were and how we did after a word from today's sponsor, Built Bar. If you're looking for a delicious snack, but you don't want all the sugar and calories, then you need the best tasting protein bar ever built. You have got to try these. If you're like me and you want to make healthier snack choices, but you don't want to compromise on taste, then I've got just the thing for you. Built Bars and Built Puffs. Built Bars are healthy and they taste amazing. Seriously, they taste so good, you will not think that they are healthy for you. What makes them so good? Well, for starters, they are all covered in 100% real dark chocolate. That's right, real chocolate. And they come in unbelievable flavors like churro, peanut butter brownie, and cookies and cream. I'm not sure how Bill does it, but these bars taste like a candy bar while maintaining amazing macros. They only have 130 calories, 4 grams of sugar, with a whopping 17 grams of protein. And now you don't need to wait around to get a box. For years, we have been talking about ordering your Built Bars at Built.com, but now you can get them at your local Walmart or Sam's Club while you can still get specialty flavors at Built.com. So head to your nearest Walmart today, walk to the pharmacy section, and grab yourself a box of Built Bars. You can pick up a four-count box of cookies and cream or double chocolate, and if you're close to a Sam's Club, run in and grab a 13-bar box with our Bilt's, with Bilt's Hit Flavors, Brownie Batter Puff and Churro Puff. You can thank me later. Bill Bar, a proud sponsor of the Locked On Podcast Network. Well, folks, I want to thank all of you for making Locked On College Basketball your first listen every day. And Isaac, I didn't check right before we recorded, but the last time I looked, we were like basically right at a thousand subscribers on the YouTube channel. I think the last number I saw was 997. So folks, if you are an everyday listener or you want to become an everyday listener, please go hit that subscribe button on YouTube. Uh, it's very, very much appreciated. We got more NBA draft declaration stuff coming up this week. Players got a couple of days as we're recording this to decide whether they're going to stay or whether they're going to go and play professionally. So that's going to be the big topic this week. And then, of course, going into June, we'll start continuing to look more at how these rosters are getting constructed right. and what is happening with the NBA draft. But for today, Isaac, I'm going to throw Get it us over to a to thousand. You. This yeah. comes up. This hair is gone. Ooh. It's happening, Andy. I'm doing it. When we hit a thousand. When we hit, so like, so soon, soon it's yeah. happening. The summer buzz down to a half inch. For those of you on YouTube, it is going to be a wild ride when we see that transition happen with Isaac and his hair. But for now, Isaac, I want to hear you talk about those Wildcats, the Villanova ones specifically, <laughs> those Wildcats and the prediction that you had about them before the season started. Okay. Uh, this was one that I, I got pretty dead on, Andy, yeah. believe it or Great. not. Uh, is the the bold prediction was that for the first time in like the newest iteration of the Big East since all those mm -hmm. teams bolted back in uh, 2013-14 mm -hmm. that Villanova would go back to back seasons without winning at least a share of the Big East regular season title and mm -hmm. that was what absolutely happened. Now the other part of it, as I said, Creighton would be the team to win the Big East, but we'll just shove that aside for now. Uh, so the Wildcats were 17-17 overall, 10-10 ten and 10 in the Big East. It was the first time that they've been 500 or lower, both overall and in conference play, since the 2011-12 season. They finished the Big East tied for six with Seton Hall. And um, man, I, I mean, it's just a confluence of events, Andy. We knew Justin Moore would be missing, and I think that was part of what yeah. um, led me to this. But also mm -hmm. with Kyle Neptune in his first year, mm -hmm. uh, you get kind of a pass on it. And then with sensational incoming freshman Cam Whitmore being mm -hmm. injured to start the season, it all just kind of worked together to, to not go as well for Villanova as as they've done in, mm -hmm. in recent memory. And so then you wind up sixth, and I think – we, I watched back our bold predictions episode and mm -hmm. we talked about you in particular talked about how good you thought the big East would be. Yeah. But I don't think either of us really knew yeah. just the level of mm -hmm. how unbelievably good the whole conference would be last year. Yeah. I remember being really in on Creighton, which you were as well. And Creighton, mind you, talent wise was probably the most talented team in the Big East. They just had some some health issues in the middle of the season. Calc Brenner missed some time. That really hurt them. But we saw what they were able to do in the NCAA tournament when they had all the pieces together. I remember being really high on Creighton. Uh, I was optimistic about Sean Miller at Xavier. Um, I don't remember being high on Marquette. And and I mean, Marquette was preseason pick to finish ninth uh, in by the like by most people in the big East. And so for them to have, have 
had the rise that they had under Shaka Smart in that year was was really what catapulted the Big East from being a solid basketball conference last year to an elite basketball conference last year. But on the Villanova of it, like I, I your your analysis was spot on. Kyle Neptune, new head coach, replacing a, an icon in Jay Wright. That's very difficult to do. We've seen a lot of coaches struggle with that, even who end up becoming very good head coaches, which I still think there's plenty of reason for optimism around Kyle Neptune and his future. Uh, but without him, without or without Jay Wright, without Justin Moore to begin the year, like it was kind of easy to see how the season could get off to a rocky start. I don't know that people thought they would finish, I believe, eighth in the Phil Knight Invitational, which was pretty devastating. Uh, I don't think people thought they would lose to the Portland Pilots. Uh, those are the kind of things that were, you know, that without Cam Whitmore really hurt them. But uh, I don't think this was a that terrible of a team, but I think the Big East being as good as it was uh, and some of the pieces not quite being together at the right time led Villanova to have this kind of season. I don't think they're going to repeat it. I wouldn't make this prediction again next year necessarily, but uh, I, I can see how it kind of happened for them this year. Man, I mean, they could – I don't think they – I don't think they – I would give them top four. I think it'll be a third straight year. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think they're top two. Yeah, I, I agree. I agree. I mean, we'll, we can have larger conversations about that. Creighton's roster has kind of fallen apart in a way that makes it a little harder to know what they're going to be. Marquette losing Omax Prosper is tough, but they got pretty much everybody else back. And I yeah. think that's going to yeah. make them dangerous. Xavier is still going to be very competitive, even though they've lost some talent as well. So it'll be interesting to see kind of how, how the top of that conference shakes out. Cause I think uh, Providence isn't going anywhere, even with new coach, Kim English, Georgetown's probably not going to be there yet, no. uh, but they're, they're, and they're coming. The Trust John's. me, they're coming. <laughs> and who, and yeah, who, who knows the St. John's? We're still yeah. waiting on a couple names from UConn too. So right. Exactly. Yeah. yeah we didn't mention UConn. I didn't even mention UConn. Oof. Okay. Now yeah. Andy, your second bold prediction, Darion Trammell, you already <laughs> mentioned it. Uh, <laughs> let's hear it. How'd you do yeah. Yeah, I made a prediction before the season or the second day of the season that Darian Trammell would be a third team All American. Part of the thought behind this was the Seattle U, which is where Trammell was before he transferred to San Diego State. They have produced really talented guards, really talented guards. Cameron Tyson just left that program this last year. He'd started his career at Houston, transferred to Seattle U, and was dominant. But Terrell Brown was the player that I was really focused on. Brown transferred from Seattle U to Arizona, rode the bench for a year at Arizona, then transferred to Washington, scored 20 a game for the Huskies, and was one of the Pac-12 Player of the Year candidates. And so Trammell was, in my mind, having watched him, better than Terrell Brown at uh, at um, Seattle U. Let's get that right. Uh, and so I thought him going to San Diego State, a program where he's got a starting spot, I was really optimistic about what they would do with Matt Bradley and with the pieces they had there, Lamont Butler. And Trammell didn't, he didn't reach third team All-American status. And to be honest, he didn't come close to reaching third team. I don't want to pretend that I was just right around the corner. I was not. He averaged less than 10 points per game. Granted, it was 9.8. Averaged less than three assists per game. Uh, only shot 31.5% from deep, only 36% from the field, wasn't particularly efficient during the regular season. He had his moments, but he was kind of inconsistent. Of course, San Diego State loves to play those kind of rock fight games, and the Mountain West loves those rock fight games. So there was just kind of a lot of, I don't want to say sloppy, but defensive-focused basketball that didn't allow a undersized guard whose best skill set is scoring to really shine. And I think looking back, you can see why it would have been really difficult for him to put up the kind of numbers that he would have needed to put up in order to, uh, to, to reach that threshold. But, but what we did <laughs> see from Darion Trammell was that when given the opportunity, he, I mean, he had a huge part in leading this team to a national championship appearance he's I mean I don't want to say single-handedly because no basketball game is single-handedly but <laughs> if we want to talk about a single hand Ryan Nemhard's single hand happening to touch Darion Trammell's shoulder is the reason that San Diego State made it into the final four and into the national championship game and Trammell was really really good in that game and I think a lot of people learned about him for the very first time during March and during this tremendous run that he had, and he didn't keep that up during the regular season. And I think it's easy to kind of see why that didn't happen, but the talent was very clearly there. And I, I felt in, in a lot of ways vindicated seeing him have that success in the tournament, because I know that the talent is there. And I think San Diego state fans probably saw a lot glimpses of it throughout the regular season. And they couldn't have been happier to see him put it together in March. Man, it was fun. I, I always remember back to that, performance against Alabama and just mm -hmm. oh, so a, good in that game. What a special performance that was. Um, love it. Uh, mm -hmm. Oof. What gosh, 
So, you know, we think about that defense, but mm-hmm. man, what he what he did in that one was really yeah. incredible. Andy, we have two more bold predictions that were sure to go wrong that <laughs> sort of did, but sort of didn't at the same time. We want to look at that. Man, the Big Ten and the Pac-12, they've got some championship droughts, and they continued. Also, mm-hmm. how'd Seton Hall do in that first year under Coach Holloway? We'll check in on all of that in just a second. All right, rounding out our bold predictions review today. To remind you all folks at home, the Big Ten has a national championship drought. Pause if you want to quiz yourself, but it goes back (laughs) to Michigan State in 2000. But what many folks forget is that the Pac-12 actually has an even longer championship drought. Once again, pause if you want to quiz yourself on this one. 1997 Arizona. My bold prediction, my final one, was that both of those championship droughts would continue and that it would be the Big 12 to win a third straight national championship for themselves instead. So obviously I was right on the uh, Pac-12 Big 10 side of it, but I was dead wrong on the Big 12 side of it, uh, Mm -hmm. along with I said it would be Baylor that was the one to win it. So Andy, I should have just stopped at the droughts are going to continue. I don't know why I shot myself in the foot. I think because that wouldn't be all that bold of a prediction. Yeah, I I think you're you're right. That's fair. That's a great point. Uh, Because as we looked at it, neither of those two conferences had to like, I think Mm -hmm. UCLA was the highest rated of either two conferences preseason and they were like eight. So for the Big Ten, they had eight teams that made the tournament. Their highest seed was Purdue as a one seed, a questionable one seed, we both thought. And the the Michigan State was the only one of those eight teams to make the second weekend, Andy. Like that would have been man. the bold prediction, would this would be to say one or fewer Big Ten teams will make the second weekend. That would have yeah. been wow. And then obviously Michigan State uh lost there. And then for the Pac-12, they got four teams into the tournament. The highest seeds were both Arizona and UCLA got two seeds. And same thing, only UCLA made it into the Sweet 16. And uh, that was that. Now, flipping to the other side of it, the Big 12, they did not win their third straight, although Texas and Kansas State both made the Elite Eight. And Andy, both came so close close. to making the final four. What electric games Mm -hmm. both of those were. K-State ultimately falling, obviously, to Florida Atlantic in a great game at Madison Square Garden in Texas, just kind of falling apart down the stretch there in a game they really should have won. So the Big 12 obviously had plenty of elite-level teams, but just couldn't quite do it. Kansas, who turned out to be the, the best candidate to do so lost to Arkansas in the second round. And then as to my Baylor prediction, they were a three seed, but lost to Creighton in the second round. Andy, what, what are your thoughts on, on all this way too much of a bold prediction that I made here? The, I mean, the big 10 and the PAC 12, they, they obviously want this reputation to go away. And clearly the easiest way to do that is to just win a dang national championship. <laughs> and then people will stop talking about it, but right. The issue is that they also keep losing in spectacular fashion. Like the Big Ten and the Pac-12 each respectively suffered, I think it's fair to say, a top 10 all-time NCAA tournament first round loss. Purdue over uh, to Fairleigh Dickinson is second, if not first, I think second probably because Virginia got the doors blown off of them by UMBC. But it's the second time it's ever happened where a 16 seed has lost to a one seed. And then Arizona to Princeton, you could debate whether that's a top 10 loss of all time, but I mean, it's, it's right around there. There haven't been that many 15 seeds that have beaten two seeds and Arizona was a team with a lot of momentum coming into the tournament. Princeton just smacked them around. I was going to say, that wasn't luck, man. Princeton yeah. won that basketball game. Yeah, that yeah. was not a lucky game at all. And so, like, UCLA looked like the NCAA tournament championship caliber team. They really did. And losing yeah. Jalen Clark was really devastating for them. And uh, they played well enough to beat Gonzaga. And Julian Strother kind of continued to keep that rivalry going the way that he did. But I don't think UCLA beats UConn, so I don't think it really matters yeah. no, in that right. case. But – like that was the the team that looked the most capable of doing it. And now UCLA's roster has completely flipped in a, in a lot of ways. And, and I don't know who's going to be Michigan state has a lot of talent back from a team that made the sweet 16 last year and a great incoming class. 
in a really, really good incoming class. I think Michigan State, unless I'm forgetting something off the top of my head, is probably the team out of these two conferences that I'm most favoriting right now. I know there's some momentum around USC. I'm not sure that I love them that that much yet Purdue if Edie comes back is going to be back in that conversation but you know they've had a lot of struggles in the NCAA tournament so to me like you were spot on in assuming these droughts would continue and at this point right now and it's way too early to make those kind of sweeping generalizations but it's hard to have a lot of optimism that this streak isn't going to continue for both these uh, two conferences (laughs) I just had a thought here's how I would love this streak to end for one of these conferences (laughs) UCLA Mm-hmm. Goes to the Big Ten and wins a national <laughs> That's championship. That's the end of that happen. drought, but the Pac-12 drought continues. <laughs> oh, that would be so brutal! It's it's <laughs> it's totally possible too. I mean, yeah. it's totally totally possible. Gosh. Uh, okay, Andy. Let's get. Uh, you know, we can leave the Big Twelve stuff behind. We don't need to dwell on that. Let's get mm-hmm. to your final bold prediction of last yeah. season. I was real optimistic about my boy Shaheen Holloway taking over at Seton Hall. I was pumped. I love what he did at St. Peter's. I love the defensive intensity of those teams. I liked what we heard from him in preseason press conferences. And uh, I predicted that they would be, uh, they would in our top four seed in the NCAA tournament, which my gosh, that was bold. Not like top four in the big East, which was also would have been bold and also did not happen. Um, but top four team in the NCAA tournament, they did not make the NCAA tournament. They did not finish in the top ten, top five of the Big East. They finished sixth, tied for sixth with Villanova, who we already talked about. Uh, and if, yeah, effectively, the reasoning for Seton Hall was that Shaheen always really, really good at defense, but the offense just was not there. And, and it was too early. Uh, team Coaches don't turn teams around in one year. I mean, we'll see what Patino uh, and Cooley at Georgetown, like what they do. There's some other coaches that uh, there's some optimism that things will turn around quickly, but it's hard. It's I mean, even in the transfer portal era, it's hard to turn a team around really quickly. And and this Seton Hall team again, they were very good defensively. They kind of brought you down into these rock fight games in the Big East, and nobody wanted to play them in the Big East. Even the teams, even the Marquettes, the Xavier's, the Yukons of the world, they didn't want to play them. Uh, but at the end of the day, Seton Hall shot less than thirty three percent from deep, less than or barely forty four percent from the field as a team. They were less than seventy percent from the free throw line. Like this team was just not good offensively they only had three guys over 10 points per game and um, their leading score was Amir Dawes and he was at 12 and a half points per game and the team just didn't have enough offensive firepower and Shaheen's got some work to do he's got to figure out how to how to kind of come up with an offense that's going to play in the Big East and I think the adjustment from St. Peter's to the Big East is is significant there's no debate about that and taking a a real cursory look at the offseason for for the Pirates uh, they've lost a whole bunch of of players. They've had a lot of players under the transfer portal. They've got some good guys coming in. A day with Sue from St. John's is a player that I think is very good. They got Jaden Bediaco, uh, the older brother of Charles Bediaco, who was at Santa Clara last year. He's now coming over to Seton Hall. He's a solid rim protecting defensive player, but the big knock on Jaden Bediaco at Santa Clara was he can't score. So I'm like, if Shaheen's still adding players who are defensive focused, like they need dudes who can score the basketball and they don't have them right now they didn't really have them last year they had a few guys who were solid i think this is going to be a multi-year thing but i i have a the utmost confidence that shaheen can turn this team around but they got to figure it out on the offensive end and, and it didn't happen last year and i don't think to your point i don't think it's going to happen next year either i mean no. we just talked a, a couple minutes ago about how loaded the big east should be again mm-hmm. and of the few teams that were behind them saint john's mm-hmm. i think is going to jump ahead yeah, of them exactly. this year and then mm-hmm. Butler, DePaul, Georgetown. I think I don't see DePaul jumping up. No. Uh, and Georgetown, that I don't. I mean, that one's curious to me. But I mean, I, th- I think Seton Hall is probably a bottom three Big East team next yeah. season. Andy, is that yeah. fair in your book? Yeah, it's going to be tough. I mean, Butler's added a lot of players, but I'm not super confident in their direction yet. Yep. But with them and DePaul and Seton Hall, I think that's kind of where. I mean, I don't think Creighton's going to fall that far. I don't think anybody else is going to fall that far. So yeah, I think they're probably in that range at this point. Well, folks, we did okay. I think we did okay. You might think differently. Let us know if you think that we did awful or if you think we did too good and we should make our predictions bolder next year, which I'm happy to do. Um, I thought Darian Trammell, third team All-American and Seton Hall as a top four seed were pretty darn bold as it was, but I always have fun with this. This is one of my favorite kind of exercises just to get a chance to to kind of explore some different areas of college basketball. But uh, we'll bring this back again next year. But of course, for now, as we continue into the end of May and the start of June, we'll keep looking at those NBA draft decisions and what those mean for their respective teams. 
Um, again, check us out on, on YouTube. If you haven't already, go hit that subscribe button. We're trying to get to a thousand. We're trying to get Isaac's hair shaved down to a much, much smaller level than it is now. So go hit that subscribe button on YouTube. Go leave us a review on iTunes if you have not done so yet. We'll be back with four more fantastic episodes this week to close out Memorial Day and the final week of May. Thank you all for listening. And as always, peace out.